Brother Jesse, come and share what the Lord has laid in your heart. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I invite your attention to open in Romans chapter 8 this morning. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 12. It says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. I want to look at as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That means that if you're not led by the Spirit of God, you're not a son of God, or you're not a child of God. Right. Well, that's, that's clear enough. But we live in a day when there's a lot of uncertainty about what it means to be led by the Spirit of God. And so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. We're going to be looking at being led by the Spirit of God. The references we're going to look at, and when we talk about the Spirit, we're talking about the Spirit of God. We're not talking about some other spirit. But it's essential to be led by the Spirit of God, because otherwise you're not a son of God. You're not a child of God. Right along in that... Stimulate your thinking a little bit. In 1 Corinthians 11, we have something to ponder on. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. Now, we are just... Notice that we need to be led by the Spirit of God. Now Paul steps in and says, be followers of me. And then he says about, you, you keep the ordinances as I deliver them unto you. Who are we to follow? Are we to follow the Spirit of God? Are we to follow Paul? Or are we to follow the ordinances? Yes. Let's look into it deeper. Another thought along that same line is in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works." You could say all who will be led by the Spirit of God shall suffer some um, reproach or some damage because of it in this life. There's going to be some hardships that are going to come into their life because of it. Because we know that if you live godly in Christ Jesus, it means you're led of the Spirit. But we have those people, and then we also have those who are not led by the Spirit. They are the evil men and seducers. And they're going to wax worse and worse as the days come to the last, the last few days. The safeguard against being led astray or being, um, you know, being led astray is to continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. In, in Timothy's situation, he had learned them from Paul and also from the Holy Scriptures. 
The Holy Scriptures are that which will keep us from being led astray by these evil men and seducers, if we make proper use of them. It says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So does that have to do with God's Spirit? Is that His Holy Spirit that brought about the, the writing of the Word of God? And it's an essential part of the man of God being perfect, thoroughly furnished, uh, able to manifest all the good works that God intends for you to manifest. It's essential to have all Scripture. And if you understand that all Scripture is a product of the Spirit of God, maybe it helps bring some things together for us. You know, oftentimes we read through the, the Bible, we read a short section, now that's interesting, but we never take the time to go and study that topic throughout the whole Bible and see just how much the Bible actually says about any given topic. <coughs> and sometimes it's quite amazing the vastness of the references dealing with any one topic. Um, there can be great blessing there to follow something clear through. And for the sake of simplicity this morning, we're going to do this in the order that they occur in the Bible. Not necessarily in any, um, you know, building up. Although I notice it does kind of build up pretty good. But we're going to start in Numbers chapter 2. And it'll make it easier for following along. We're going to see what insight we can gain into the Spirit of God. And... You know, get a little better understanding of him and how he, what he desires, what he's like. Um, so that we can better understand if we're being led by the Spirit of God or if it's something else. But in Numbers chapter 2, the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house. Far off from the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. On the east side toward the rising of the sun shall they have the standard that the camp of Judah pitch. And then it says who their leader will be. And then there's going to be three tribes on this side, three tribes on the east. There will be the tabernacles in the middle, then three tribes on the other side. Anyway, a very orderly camp. Was it just dead formalism? Verse 34 says, And the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. So they pitched by their standards, and so they set forward, every one by their families according to the house of their fathers. But anyway, you had three tribes on one side, called it the camp of Judah. And that actually comprised three tribes. But there you had one person that was over the whole thing, it sounds like. Were they led by Moses? Or were they led by the Lord? Well, they were led by the Lord or by the Spirit through Moses. Okay? I think that's understandable enough. Now, imagine somebody in the tribe of Judah. Back in their Egypt days, he lived next door to, to John in the tribe of Ephraim. And they get out in the wilderness now, and now the tabernacle is between them. It's like... I really did like having John for a neighbor. And this Moses fellow, he's putting a wedge in there. He's putting the tabernacle between us now. You know, I feel led to live beside John. I feel like the Spirit's moving me to live beside John. No, I hope nothing like that happened. 
I mean, because the spirit, the spirit had had led there to be a tabernacle between you now, all right? So the spirit, so the spirit's leading at times causes people to have to lay aside their personal preferences because that's not the way he's instructed for you to live at this time. The tabernacle is now between you. So it would be foolish for them to say, well, I feel like the spirit is leading me to leave my family, family camp, and go live with John's family in a totally different tribe. And in chapter 4, the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, take the sum of the sons of Kohath. And it talks about the Levites, the different divisions of the Levites, and it assigns their responsibilities in the moving of the tabernacle. It gets, I mean, it's like these guys are responsible for the altar, and these are for, it lays it all out and explains how the, the priests are supposed to cover things before the Levites come close, and very, very orderly. And yet that was, that was the Spirit of God working giving direction through Moses. Um, when it came time to move, move the camp, move the tabernacle, they knew exactly what they were supposed to do. They could go in at the right time, pick up their, what they were supposed to pick up, and move. And the last verse of that chapter says, According to the commandment of the Lord, they were numbered by the hand of Moses, everyone according to his service and according to his burden. <coughs> Thus were they numbered of him, as the Lord commanded Moses. And you know, you could whine if you wanted to. If you were a Kohathite, it's like, you know what, I would rather, I, I would rather have a little different part in the moving process. I feel like I ought to work with the, the Gershonites. But you know what? The Spirit of God has given direction for you, and this is your role to fill. Make good use of it. But very orderly. It was very useful in getting things moved in an efficient manner. And in chapter 10, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. When they blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east part shall go forward. When they blow an alarm the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journeys. But when the congregation is to be gathered together, you shall blow, but you shall not sound an alarm. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you this for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. Okay, there we have instruction concerning the making of the trumpets and their use. There's a difference between like blowing an alarm and they obviously had little different sounds that they made depending on the situation and when they were ready to move you blew the trumpet and then the ones in the east started moving and then you blew again and very, very orderly. God was seeking to convey a clear understanding of exactly what was expected with each noise. It was an orderly camp. A very important thing, too, because with such a large number of people, um, if they would all insisted on being led by the Spirit, in other words, like a lot of people think of being led by the Spirit, um, it would have been hard to get everybody going in the right direction. Now, within, within this, these directions, there was things that were left up to individuals to decide. Like where you wanted the furniture in your house. What order you wanted that in. 
or in your tent. Um, but when it came to helping everybody be moving in the right direction, the Spirit of God gave specific instruction. Now, in chapter 27, when Moses is about ready to die, I notice his concern. In 27.15. And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. It's like, well, what about just letting the Spirit lead? <coughs> well, that is what they're doing here. They're getting the Spirit to lead them through a shepherd. The Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua the son of man, in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. Thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of of Israel may be obedient. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At his word shall they go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation, and laid his hands upon him, and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. God wanted a man set over the people. Somebody to guide them in and out. And yet that man was to be in tune with the Spirit of God. But it's interesting that even though it says that of Joshua, a man in whom is the Spirit, that Joshua was instructed to go inquire of Eleazar. Eleazar was going to be the source of the Spirit's direction to the congregation. Joshua had the responsibility of then being the one to address the people and guide them in and out. But as Joshua was doing that, as he got his direction through Eleazar, the Spirit was able to direct the people. The Spirit was, the people were being led by the Spirit as they followed Joshua's, Joshua as he was obedient to the direction given to him. Imagine if the people would have been, you know what, I want to be led by the Spirit. If God wants me to go out, if God wants us to go out against the enemy, he can talk to me personally. And if you had 100,000 people like that. You know, I want to personally hear from God. It's like, yeah, didn't you hear what Joshua said? You heard. How much more personal do you need it to be? Um, God doesn't have to come and speak to 100,000 of you in the quietness of your own tent. He can give a message to Joshua. It's a message inspired from God. Um, that's the way God chose. That's the way the Holy Spirit chose to lead the people. In First Samuel chapter eleven. We have Saul had Saul had been anointed king. There were certain people that despised him. But then starting in verse one, then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead, and all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. 
The elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days' respite, that we may send messengers unto all the coasts of Israel. And then, if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. <coughs> what, a, what an offer there for making a covenant. Lay it for reproach upon all Israel. Like this guy is just trying to make a mockery of our nation. Then came the messengers of Gibeah of Saul to Gibeah of Saul and told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. And behold, Sam, Saul came after the herd out of the field. And Saul said, What aileth the people that they weep? They told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly. And he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces and sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. It's interesting to notice that it specifically states that the Spirit of God came upon him. Just so that you know, the, the actions that are going to be immediately related after this were a product of the Spirit of God moving. Okay? His anger was greatly kindled. <clears throat> such a thing, such a reproach ought not to be laid on the people of God. This um, this is not to be tolerated. But it's interesting that he took the, that o those oxen, cut them in pieces, and said, sent them around and said, you know, whoever doesn't come out after Saul and Samuel, let it be done the same way to his oxen. And it says that the fear of the Lord fell on the people. Wait a minute. I thought they were afraid of what might happen to their oxen. The, the Spirit of the Lord was leading, was working, giving direction. And the people were led by it. The people yielded to it. The... the, the um, the Spirit had His way. The people came out. They were being led by the Spirit. It's like, well, I thought they were being, the king would threaten them. What the king said was perfectly in line with the leading of the Spirit. And it was God, it was God moving. It was God desiring this to take place. In chapter 30 of the same book, we have when David was living in the country of the Philistines, there in Ziklag, he was hoping to go to battle with them, but then they sent him back home and they found out that the city had been taken and everybody was taken captive and and in verse 6 of chapter 30, David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Here the people there felt something. They were being led by something. They were being led by the grief that they felt. They felt like the appropriate thing to do would be to kill David. After all, he's been a real disappointment to us. We were trusting that he would deliver us from all our enemies. And now here we are. We just lost our whole family. They were being led by their grief. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought hither the ephod to David. 
And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. David inquires of God. And God led through David. Or the Spirit of God led through David. He said, yes, go for it. You can get it all back. God didn't tell everybody that except through David. The others were all being led by their own grief. David was able to rein that in and go inquire of God. And it was a good thing he could, he could do that. But we have David led by the Spirit of God to pursue after the enemy and recover everything. First Chronicles chapter 12. First Chronicles 12:32. It's talking about the large numbers of people that were coming to David when he was yet having to flee, yet uh, hiding from Saul. And in Second Chronicles 12:32, it makes this statement: "And the children of Issachar." which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. The heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. It says that there was 200 of them, men that had understanding to know of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. These were obviously people that were in tune with God enough to to understand that he was what he was trying to do, that he was moving to put David on the throne. This was understanding that came from the Spirit of God. As they looked, watched what was going on, they, they probably were aware of the fact that David had been anointed, and they see that the time is getting ripe now. It says that all their brethren we're at their commandment. Were the, all the brethren being led by the Spirit? Yes. In that regard, in regard to this matter, they were. They were being led by the Spirit, working through those 200. In chapter 28 of the same book, David is giving instruction to Solomon concerning the, the building of the temple. In chapter 28, starting at verse 9. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build an house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. And David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and of the houses thereof and of the treasuries thereof and of the upper chambers thereof and the inner parlors thereof and of the place of the mercy seat and the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord and of all the chambers round about of the treasuries of the house of God and of the treasuries of the dedicated things. Okay, he said, the, the Spirit, the Spirit gave me all these instructions. Also, for the courses of the priests and the Levites, and for all the work of the service of the house of the Lord, and for all the vessels of the service of the house of the Lord, he gave of gold by weight for things of gold, for all instruments of all manner of service, silver also for all instruments of silver by weight, for all instruments of every kind of service. 
even the weight for the candlesticks of gold and for their lamps of gold by weight for every candlestick and for the lamps thereof and for the candlesticks of silver by weight both for the candlestick and also for the lamps thereof according to the use of every candlestick and by weight he gave gold for the tables of showbread for every table and likewise silver for the tables of silver also pure gold for the flesh hooks and for the bowls and the cups and for the golden basins he gave gold by, gold by weight for every basin and likewise silver by weight for every basin of silver and for the altar of incense refined gold by weight and gold for the pattern of the chariot of the cherubims that spread out their wings and covered the ark of the covenant of the lord all this said david the lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me even all the works of this pa pattern. And David said to Solomon, his son, be strong and of a good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. And he, he will not fail thee nor forsake thee until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. And behold, the courses of the priests and then the Levites, even they shall be with thee for all the service of the house of God. They shall be with thee for all manner of workmanship, every willing, skillful man, for all, any manner of service. Also the princes and all the people will be holy at thy commandment. David said, I got all this instruction from the Spirit of the Lord, from the Spirit. And he even goes through and, you know, talks about the different rooms and talks about different vessels so much gold for this one quite a lot is just really spelled out there now as the builders were building this according to the guidelines were they being led by the spirit well Well, yes, except that it wasn't necessarily the Spirit working inside of each one personally. I mean, they just had to give themselves to go according to the instructions. But it was some instructions that uh, somebody who was dead had written down. It's like, what if the builders thought, you know what? I just want to be led by the Spirit. And they start tinkering with the instructions a little bit, changing it, because after all, I feel like this would be better. God would not have dwelt there. He would not have put his stamp of approval on it if they had done that. They were being led by the Spirit of God as they followed the instructions that David had left them. David had received it from the Spirit. Okay, so to be led by the Spirit of God, they had to yield to the instruction that had been given to them by a human being. Look in Nehemiah chapter 9. He makes some interesting uh, statements just in case you were wondering just how much involved the Holy Spirit was in some of Israel's history. Yeah, there's a few verses here in chapter 9. I wanted especially to notice the first one was chap verse 20. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them, and withheldest not thy manna from their mouth, and gavest them water for their thirst. So, a lot of the commandments given to Israel was the Holy Spirit. That was the Holy Spirit instructing. In verse 26, it says, Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebellious against thee, and cast thy law behind their backs, and slew thy prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee. And they wrote, wrought great provocations. 
They were disobedient, rebelled against thy law. No, rebelled against thee, cast thy law behind their backs. What did they want to be led by the Spirit, perhaps? Wait a minute. The law was an inspiration of the Spirit. It was a, the working of the Spirit. They cast that behind their backs. The prophets come along and seek to bring them back to God, back to the law. There's no, no difference there. And 29, and testifiest against them that thou mightest bring them again unto thy law. Yet they dealt proudly and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. And withdrew the shoulder and hardened their neck and would not hear. Yet many years didst thou forbear them and testifiest against them by thy spirit in thy prophets. There you have it, by thy spirit in thy prophets. Yet would they not give ear, therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. So you have the Holy Spirit working to bring the people back to the law. Now why not? Because the law was given by the Spirit. Right. And that's how you come back to God, is you come back to the instruction that the Spirit has given for you. In Isaiah chapter 63, 63, verse 7, I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us, and the great kindness toward the house of Israel which he hath bestowed on them according to his mercies. And according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses, for he said, surely, surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their savior. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of the Lord, angel of his presence, saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bare them, and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him, that led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name, that led them through the deep as an horse in the wilderness, that they should not stumble, as a beast goeth down into the valley of the Spirit of the Lord, goeth down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord caused him to rest, so didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. They vexed his Holy Spirit. You know, we're told to not grieve the Holy Spirit. We have the example of them vexing his Holy Spirit and how then he turned to be their enemy. But in these verses, the role that the Holy Spirit played, it was very much involved there. And they very much despised it. If we turn over to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Jesus is talking to his 12 disciples. Um, he had sent them out two by two. He sent them forth and commanded them. And one of the things he said is in 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. 
But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents, and cause them to be put to death. Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. I think there's a principle there that God still operates by. You know, this was addressed to the twelve, but um, we notice when they do this for my sake. In other words, you are doing what I want you to do. You are laboring for me. And as you do that, you will meet opposition. Don't don't fret about how you're going to answer when you're called to give an account. You've been obedient to me. When you are called before the council, governors, I will watch over it. I will give you the words to say when you encounter that. Don't, don't draw back. You know, it says that he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Don't let your fear of, I don't know how I would deal with that if I had to stand before the king and he asked me, well, I don't know what he would ask me, but I don't know if I could really answer very well. It's like, don't let that cause you to shrink back from being obedient to what I've called you to. If you get into that situation, my spirit will give you the words to say. But notice the obedience that came before my spirit moving you in that specific situation to give you answers that aren't necessarily found in the Bible. They were first of all making use of the instruction that was left to them. In John chapter 14, 1426, it's another little thing about the Holy Spirit. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. He'll teach you all things. But notice how that's then connected with bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, those things that the Spirit would be teaching would never, would never be in conflict with those things that Jesus had taught them. Because if they ever were, what would be the point of also, let's see, I'm teaching you this, and also remember what Jesus said. If there was a conflict there, what would be the point of having them both brought together? They must always be harmonious. They would never be in opposition to each other. And in the 16th chapter of the same book, verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will, shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. 
He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he would, shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. The Holy Spirit, yes, he will guide you, but it's going to be building understanding of those things that those things that you already been taught or that you have already received for the most part he will also show you things to come yes but that will never take the place of things that he's told you to do he may give you insight into things that are yet to come but uh, concerning things that he expects you to do don't look for any different understanding than what's already been laid out by him in the written word. Examples of uh, direction for specific situations in Acts chapter 10, we have the example of Peter. In Acts 10, verse 19, Peter has just had that vision with all those unclean animals. And he's not sure what to make of it. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Peter was walking in obedience to God. He had this vision. He didn't understand what it meant. The Spirit told him, there's three men seeking you, you go with them. But the Spirit didn't tell him what it was all about. So when Peter comes down, he asked the people, you know, what, what's the cause? I mean, why have you sent for me? So the Spirit gave him enough guidance to get him going in the right direction. You could say these are, this was one of those little details in life that the Word of God hadn't spelled out for Peter, but Peter was making use of what the Word of God had spelled out to him. And then when he was in this situation, the Spirit of God nudged him, said, go with them. In Acts 13, Pretty similar. It came to pass, no, oh, let's see, 13. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manan, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, hmm, so it's that the Holy Ghost sent them forth. I thought it was the people that did that. The Holy Ghost did it through those people. They were diligent about the work that they were supposed to be doing. And as they were doing that, God nudged them a little bit and said, I've got a special outreach work here. And I want Paul and Barnabas to go be sent on. Do it. Take care of it. But there was specific instruction for a certain situation that was not spelled out in the Word of God. But there again, it was people who were being faithful to God and in 16, Acts 16, verse 6. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. They had some good ideas here. Preaching the word in Asia, um, Bithynia. 
It was a good thing. But the Holy Spirit somehow let them know it's not the right time. Maybe a good idea, but the timing's not right. You know, you could easily think right off that, oh, it was a, preaching's a good thing, all right? I'm not allowed to, or I've been hindered from, it must be the devil. But no, in this situation, it was the Spirit of God directing them a little different way. But they were somehow able to perceive that it was the Spirit of God giving a little different direction. In 1 Corinthians 14, 14.26, interesting picture here of the church coming together. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, let all things be done decently. You know, let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Quite a picture here. Everybody had something they wanted to share. It's like, this is wonderful. How about letting the Spirit lead? Yeah, that's what Paul is doing. Paul is laying down these guidelines that it gives you understanding of how the Spirit will lead. Right. Oh. Oh. Well, what if, the, what if that means that I can't say anything? But I feel like I want to say something. Can my feeling be wrong? If my feeling is contrary to what's been inspired of God, to the written word, my feeling's coming from somewhere different. Let all things be done unto edifying. In other words, it's not all about me being able to share what I want to share. It's all about whether or not the church is properly edified by it. And these are the guidelines to make sure that the church is able to receive edification from it. And the elders are responsible, responsible to make sure these guidelines are being upheld. Don't just let everybody do according as how they feel. Because if their feelings are out of alignment with this, it's not from the Spirit of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, we have some additional guidelines for the church. It's like, well, why don't you talk about how things are supposed to operate at home. Well, kind of like with how the camp of Israel was set up. 
Why don't they talk about the arrangement of the furniture in individual people's tents? No, there's a little bit of guidelines there. If you're not permitted to have an idol. But otherwise, there was a lot of flexibility there. Um, there's a lot of flexibility in your home. But when it comes to the church gathering together, it needs to be within some... Um, you know, you're representing God now as a whole. You as a group are representing God. Make sure you're doing it in a very noble manner. But in First Timothy chapter 3, it's talking about the qualifications for leaders. And then it says in 14, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, Timothy. Timothy's led by the Spirit of God. But Paul doesn't say, you know, the Spirit of God's going to teach you all that you need to know as far as how you're to conduct yourself in the house of God. He said, here are the instructions here are the type of leaders you shall have. This is to help you understand how the church of God is to operate and with what type of people are to be directing it. It was not in conflict with being led by the Spirit of God. It was very much a part of helping you know what was the Spirit's leading. It matters very much how God is represented very much what his church is like because that's basically God being represented in Revelation chapter 22 <coughs> Revelation 22 verse 17 and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst, Come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The come. Does it make a difference? Whether it's the Holy Spirit that told you come, whether it's the church that said come, or whether it's somebody else that said come. If they're telling you to take of the water of life freely, consider it to be the Spirit, regardless of what avenue through which he's speaking. The water of life freely. Don't let it be hindered. Take it as it is. Don't be splitting the water of life. Let it have free course in you. The water of life, be that the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, revealed through the written word, um, be that Jesus Christ, which there's really no difference, it's all in essence the same. But the come. Partake of the water of life. The leading of the Holy Spirit. Do you have a preference that the leading of the Holy Spirit be written or verbal? Oh, a lot of people would take the verbal over the written, wouldn't they? In other words, they really feel like they're being led by the Spirit of God if they had a dream last night and I heard a voice. But if you're not serious about the leading of the Holy Spirit through the written Word of God, 
Um, why are you so eager to hear a voice? Why are you so eager for that type of leading? The next time, next time I would like to look at the alternative. The alternative to being led by the Spirit through the written word, the prominence of the written word in being led by the Spirit, what is the alternative? And what will that produce? So I hope you have benefited from this, that it's amazing how orderly the Spirit of God mm -hmm. is. How he's so practical. I mean, they had a camp set up that was so... I mean, people could look at that and go, that, I mean, how could you do anything better than that, really? Dealing with all those people and everything. A lot of instruction, yes. Um, a lot was spelled out for you. You could feel cramped by that. It's like, oh, I just don't feel like I can be express myself. It's like, well, <clears throat> if you're wanting to express yourself contrary to the instructions, then it's a self that's faithful. I mean, it's a self that's corrupt. Um, but then also the instructions for the church, the ordering of the church. Very detailed. I mean, in some regards, within these parameters, there's, there's some uh, liberty. But don't, don't say you're being led by the Spirit when you're going contrary to, to what like the Apostle Paul laid out Tim, for Timothy and such people. And, you know, you want to be led by the Holy Spirit. Well, and Paul says, be followers of me. If Paul is being led by the Spirit, you following Paul, it's just you being led by the Spirit through the Apostle Paul. There's really no conflict there. And for us to try and make a, a conflict there, to justify something else, is a product of our own depravity. So, thank you for listening. Thank you, Brother Jesse. Uh, anybody who really cared about the common sense of Scripture would see that, but uh, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And we're told not to believe every spirit, but try the spirits, for there are many false prophets. So, why assume that what I'm feeling impressed with is the Spirit of God and not a seducing spirit? Um, how do you know? Well, the Word of God has been preserved for us so we can know what the apostles who were led by the Spirit would do and what uh, the prophets who were led by the Spirit would do. And Paul said, if any man have a problem with what I'm saying, uh, if any be ignorant, let him be ignorant. But he said, if any man think himself a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people out there who want the excuse of following the Spirit so they can follow their appetite, whose God is their belly. Uh, they want to follow their appetites and their feelings. Let's stand together. If you want to follow the Spirit of God, you're going to follow the Word of God, the Law of God, the Prophets of God, the Apostles of God, the Son of God. You're not going to follow your appetite. Any thoughts before we pray?